Hello, and we're live. It's 10 o'clock p.m., and do you know where your children are? This is Phil Russert. I am the owner-promoter of CreatorCon. It's a convention where our celebrities are the creators, and we'll have wall-to-wall -wall comics, thousands of comics. And if you can, go to www.creatorconevent.com. Uh, the website is under construction, but you can leave your email to where we can put you on an email list, and you'll get... Updates on everything that happens with CreatorCon. <clears throat> Before we get started with tonight's event, uh, this is a project that's been done because I want to help artists. I mean, we're going to have big names on this show coming in the future, but I also want to help indie artists. I want to help unpublished artists who are trying to break into the industry. The whole point of this is to remember the community as a whole, to unite us, to help each other. We should be helping each other. That's the point. So I'm doing this, and I promise you, uh, as much as we will have big names on future shows, uh, you know, well-known, established people, everyone is welcome here. Even if you're unpublished, you're welcome to be a guest on this show. Having said that, I do want to do a few shout-outs before we get going. Uh, Mad Titan Comics, that's Mad Titan underscore comics on Instagram is a really good comic dealer with great prices, everything from graded books and slabbed books to uh, raw copies, etc. If you look on Instagram, his name is Eric Gunderson, and Eric Gunderson also has a group page under Mad Titan Comics. If you want good deals and you want that book, reach out, check him out, Instagram, okay? I also wanted to mention Lula Lucas. Lou Lucas is a local Long Island artist who's been really making headway in the last year. Very kind, very sweet person, also very talented. And she actually just made a great announcement that she's going to have a variant cover for Vampirella, Trial of the Soul, due in September through, um, it's a special variant due through uh, Get Slabbed Comics. It will also be sold in retail at Royal Collectibles in Queens, New York, and Genesis Comics and Gaming in Ronkonkoma, New York. Um, she's a very talented artist that takes commissions. Again, if you type in Lula Lucas, that's L-U-K-A-S, uh, you'll find her on Instagram and Facebook. Please follow and support her. We're also going to mention Hero Shack, HeroShack.com. Christopher Tomolovich, one of the finest people you ever meet, is the artist and writer of his own book, and he will be found in all of his uh, products will be found on Hero uh, HeroShack.com. He just had a successful Kickstarter, so keep an eye out for his next Kickstarter campaign. That will probably be out soon, and you can go to his site to get all that information. I also want to mention Cody Johnson with Comic Chat Authority. Uh, go to YouTube. They have a really good um, indie comic podcast. They do a lot of reviews oh. of really indie comics, you know, like the rare indie comics as well. And they'll have indie com uh, artists that you may not see very often in interviews. They, um, they review their books and they have guests on. I also want to talk about uh, Toy Apocalypse. Toy Apocalypse is an online toy store right now. You can find them on eBay at toypocalypse.net on eBay. They are working on their website, but please follow them. They have a lot of great toys, Q-Figs, Pops, uh, horror pins, everything. So they and they're really kind people. It's Laura and Patrick Lynch. I really recommend you go check them out. They'll have everything for your kids, uh, for collectors, etc. Um, to round everything out, there's Les Dudis, L E S D U D I S on Instagram. Les Dudis and lesdudis.com, which is the website, which I highly recommend you go there. It's basically letsdodis.com beyond pop culture. If you want to know pop culture and geek lifestyle, you want reviews on comic conventions, all those things, I have to tell you, Andy is great. Uh, he's, he's very objective. He's a fan. So if you want to know what's a good con to go to, you go to his site. He'll give you the review. And he reviewed mine really well. Yay. Anyway, having said that, tonight we are going to have Scott Hanna on. I'm sure as comic fans and collectors, we know who he is. If not, we will explain. Before we do, I just want to let you know that Scott has his Arts and Fashion Institute that is run by him and his wife. Uh, they do art classes, which are going to be starting actually July 29th and 30th. 
and August 4th and 7th. And um, Scott is a genuinely good person who really likes to teach. If you want to build confidence, if you want to build your skills, this is the school to go to. I also want to mention his wife. Um, she's a wonderful lady. I mean, honestly, I can't say enough good things about her. Um, she also runs her own Etsy shop. And at the Etsy shop, she has uh, masks that she makes. It's basically, uh, sorry, let me get that name. It's he Helping Heroes. And what she does is she makes these masks for hospitals and hospice. And the masks are like superheroes, uh, Doctor Who, all types of pop culture. And then there's also some generic ones that are just really nice looking. And I have to tell you, Pamela Patak is her name, by the way. I have to tell you. She's a very kind person, very talented. And if you've ever seen Scott Hanna at a show, he wears these custom-made uh, comic shirts. Those are made by her. I mean, they're made custom for him. But if you like the quality, you see what she can do there. Just imagine what she'll do for the masks. So please go check out her Etsy shop. Okay? Um, I'm sure it's going to be posted in the, um, in the link. Uh, the link will be posted in the discussion room. So having said that, Scott Han is a legend in the industry. If you're a comic book collector, the chances are you have hundreds of books that he has inked. He's been on Batman, all the Spider-Man titles, amazing Spider-Man. I mean, he's done major storylines like uh, Batman when, um, when he had his, you know, the, the breaking of the bat, uh, Nightfall. Uh, he's done every. He had, I think, 15 years on Spider-Man. He's done X-Men. He's done X-Men versus Avengers. He's done. Uh, so many things. If you don't know who he is, uh, I you you'd probably be surprised how many comics you own by him. So having said that, uh, I'd like to welcome Scott Hanna into our chat. Hello. Hi, Scott. How you doing? Thanks for coming out and being my first guest. I appreciate it. Very good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, there's no better way to start with a legend in the industry. <laughs> It's always um, weird to hear that about yourself, you know. We we never think of ourselves that way, seriously. Well, the humble ones don't, and I have to say, you are really one of the most humble stars. In, you know, I mean, you're a celebrity in the comic industry, and you're very humble. And it's always a pleasure to speak to you at shows. I'm sure a lot of people here know I have spoken to you at a show, and you're just a down to earth guy. It's fun to talk to you, and and just hear some stories that you tell. And and I love your wife shirts. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm, I'm modeling one today. This is actually uh, Star Wars villains characters. Uh, and she decided that she, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, there's actually like a red and blue lining on the pocket because she thought, oh, wait, they have red and blue lightsabers, right? So I'm gonna, she's going to add some lightsaber elements for me. So she, she throws these things in just to, to be uh, cool and make it different and unique. That's really cool. I, those little touches too show the fandom. <laughs> you know, you love that. Yes. yes, we embrace our geekdom. You know, that's how it works. Well, that, you know, that's the funny thing is I think some people forget too that you're a fan and you were a fan of some of the people that we we love as well. You know, I mean, getting in the industry, I can imagine you were probably humbled in the beginning and like, oh my God, I'm seeing my my heroes or the people that I looked up to. Uh, what one of the the weirdest things for me is that uh, when I was young, I never dreamed that I would end up being a professional doing comics. Uh, so you grow up loving this stuff, and I, I think I started actively reading superhero comics when I was about ten. Uh, but when I finally did decide to go into the industry in my mid twenties, um, I almost immediately started meeting and working with all the people I grew up with because they were still in the industry. And it, it literally, I, I think if you do this for a job, you're always a fanboy at heart. That's, that's really the way it is. Was there anybody when you started that you got to work with pretty early that you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe this. I'm working with so-and-so. Well, the, the first, uh, I didn't really work with them per se, but one of the first um, kind of celebrities in my mind that uh, when I got working at DC Comics, I was uh, I used to visit the offices regularly because I lived in New York City. So I would come in, drop off work, or meet editors or whatever. My very first editor, who was giving me my first project, um, he was just walking me down the hall, 
and we ran into Dick Giordano, who is a totally legendary inker. Uh, we actually ended up getting to be very good friends over the course of my career. Um, but he he was working at DC at the time, and went, ah, it's Dick Giordano, and he had <laughs> like Neil Adams, and he, you know. And um, and he gave me a, a, a very quick critique, and I'm like, oh man, he, like he's tearing apart. Work. And he actually just gave me like this one little notation. I'm like, that makes perfect sense. He's totally on the nose. I'm going to pay attention to that. So that one of the things you do in this industry is you absorb like a sponge all the good advice you can get from the creative people right. before you, even the people who come after you. There's so there are so many talented people that you want to learn from all of them. Well, I think one of the rules to success is you have to have a thick enough skin to be able to take criticism, whether it's hard or soft. Just take it for what it is. It's a, it's a way to improve, not a way to hurt. Yeah, what, th this is, it may sound a little weird to some people, but in my experience, I've worked with dozens and dozens of different artists. And usually the ones that are the most sensitive and that don't want any feedback are the ones that don't get better. Right. The ones that actually are looking for feed, constructive criticism, not just like, you don't just tear people apart. You say why it needs work or what's wrong with it. It's, that's what I, I'm a teacher. So I love instructing people and helping people and encouraging them, them to get better. But all the ones who listen to me have flown, like they get better really fast, a lot of them. Um, and the ones that don't listen, frequently disappear and they just they don't stay the course because you to be to improve yourself as an artist you have to listen to feedback whether it comes yeah. from writers your editors your your colorist i've i've learned so much from working with colorists and saying it's like oh wait i'm not giving them the right information to do their job so i always have to pay attention to the people before me and the people after me if i do my job properly i'm trying to make everyone's job easier Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because I was just talking to somebody recently that there's a lot of people don't realize inkers are, I mean, especially like the quality inkers in the industry are actually excellent pencilers. They're artists. You know, it's not tracing. There's an art to inking. I, I, my experience is that every single top inker you will ever meet knows how to draw very well. Uh, for Agreed. Frequently, uh, they also know how to paint very well. Uh, so actually, you can see right behind me a couple of my paintings that I've done. Um, and I actually started out, uh, I learned how to paint in oils when I was 10 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I've been painting longer than I've been inking, actually. Uh, Tom Palmer does phenomenal paintings. Joe Rubenstein does phenomenal paintings. Um, all literally every top inker in the industry knows how to pencil because you can't do our job if you don't know how to draw yourself. It's, it's real simple. Yeah. I mean, on my jams, I am behind me. I have a lot of inkers that have penciled, you know, so absolutely. But as far as inking, when you're inking a book, I mean, there's a fine line between maintaining the integrity of the penciler, but giving your own, style to the inking as well and i do know that sometimes inkers have to kind of tighten up pencils but how do you how do you do that balance i mean how do you maintain the integrity of the pencils but still put your flavor on the inks and how do you think that influences the aesthetics of the book or the, you know the the impact of the book or a series that you're working on like when you worked on nightfall i mean you know you're looking at a whole series well I, you're asking two different questions so i'll, I'll try to get to them one at a time uh, but I'm actually kind of unusual in uh, being one of the the top inkers in the industry that a lot of people actually can't recognize my style uh, because I try to adapt myself to the artists I'm working with. I try to show off their work. And uh, I could very easily impose my own style on top of theirs and ignore what they do. And there are some, uh, some really top Inkers, uh, I'll mention like Klaus Jansen is a good example that Klaus um, definitely works with certain artists very, very well, actually many artists very well, but he puts his stamp on top of it. Right. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, when I was younger, Terry Austin was the same way. Uh, phenomenal inker, made a gigantic impact on the look of the X-Men for a long time and several other books he did. 
but you could always tell when it was Terry inking it as opposed to somebody else. I, um, I actually, because I started as a penciler, I actually wanted to work when I decided to go into the inking end, I wanted to really respect the penciler's style. And so luckily one of my skill sets is I'm very adaptable. I can adapt my style, I can change my style. So I can look uh, very cartoony, I can look very realistic, I can look very uh, angular, I can look very sharp or high contrast. I can do all those different things very, very easily. For some reason, it's become natural for me to adapt my style. In the early days, it would take me about half an issue to adapt to a new penciler. Nowadays, I can literally do it in a page. I, I get into the head. Do you think that's attributed to the fact that you can use so many different mediums for your art? Like you said, you do oil paintings and things like that, or do you think that doesn't correlate? I, I think it correlates a lot because I, um, for instance, I was trained in fine art. My mother is a fine art painter uh, who does portraits and landscapes. I learned how to do real things and I learned how to do cartoony things. Um, mm -hmm. And that range, you, a, a lot of artists call style is kind of what you put on top of drawing ability. But some artists only learn style so they can't have anything else. They learn one style and that's all they can do. The better the artist, usually their foundation of drawing is the solidity underneath it, and the style is just this coding that we can adapt and change depending on the circumstances. And because I learned how to paint and draw myself very well way before I got into comics, I found out that style is this kind of fun experiment, and it's this fun partnership that I get to team up with somebody else uh, I literally try to get into their head. I try to say, okay, how do how are they thinking? How is their work looking? And so I take my certain toolkit and say, okay, I'm going to apply this part of me to this. Uh, now, no matter what, there's always part of me in there. Um, right. And also, one of my favorite things to do in comics is doing what we call finishes, where I get much rougher pencils. Right. I'm able to finish the pencils in more of my style and then I ink over my finishes. So uh, that's one of the things I really enjoy doing because I think it's a little bit more of my own personality. But e even with that, I still will frequently look at what that penciler or or teammate will do without me. Like the, fir the first time I worked with George Perez, um, I actually said, George, can you send me a bunch of your inks over yourself? Not because I wanted to copy him, but because I wanted to see how much detail he put into his work. Right. Um, and well, I wanted to put in that same amount of effort. I would do it in my own version, but I still wanted to reference his thinking, basically. Well, um, it's also doing research, and, and it's a sense of growing, too, because you're not just going in narrow-minded like, I'm going to do it my way you want to adapt to the situation and the style and, and that's probably why you put out the best work. Exactly. And I've done that with so many different artists that I love uh, trying new things and getting new looks. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, that, for me, uh, working as a partner is really an, an enjoyable part of the process. And it, it shares with my um, teaching aspect that when I teach, I actually um, look at it as a sharing of information. And when you're a teacher, you actually learn just as much from your students as you do with teaching your students. That's a great um, idea. I actually get feedback from them. I learn how to communicate with them. I learn all these different things from uh, dealing with other artists and looking at how they view the world and how to give back and forth. Um, I, I consider one of the specialties about uh, cartooning, about comics in general, is that it's a collaborative medium. We get to work together with writers, with pencilers, with colorists, and all of us together are all trying to lift each other up and make it better than any of us can do individually. Well, before we get into my question about uh, the influence, um, I want to ask you just with the flow of what's going on. So speaking of creative teams, are there any creative teams that you especially love working with uh, that you have in the past? Or 
Um, too, too many to count, but um, th there are sometimes very, very fortunate when you can work with a great partner. There are other times where you can also work with a great partner who's also a good friend um, right. or becomes a good friend. Uh, so I've worked with uh, one of my very first projects I got to work on at DC Comics was Doom Patrol with Grant Morrison writing and Richard Case uh, on the pencils. And even on that book, I was doing finishes on some of the issues. And Richard and I had both started, hadn't worked together, but we both started at the same small independent publisher. And so we hit it off really quickly. We worked together really well. And we're still friends now, 30 plus years later. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked with um, so, some people who I consider really good friends, whether mm -hmm. I work with them or not, are Tom Ranney, uh, who I worked with for many years on Thor, on the X-Men. Uh, we, we worked together for well over a decade. And I, I was so fortunate because Tom basically said I was his exclusive anchor. Like if he oh, right. wanted to work with me. Um, I worked with Mark Bagley for years, also a really good buddy, whether we work together or not, we just get along well. We think, uh, you know, similarly in a lot of respects. Um, and then I've worked with just some, some people whose skill level just blows me away and pushes me to be a better artist. Uh, so like uh, I worked with Ivan Reyes, I've worked with David Finch, I've worked yeah. with uh, John Romita Jr., one of the best storytellers in comics. Lee Weeks, one of the best storytellers in comics. So all these people, I learn from them, I grow with them, and I uh, they push me to be better. Dan Lee wanted to ask if you do freelance work. Um, pretty much all I do is freelance work. So uh, what comics, I, I've had periods of time where I've had a, a, what we call exclusive contracts with Marvel or DC, but for the vast majority of my career, I've worked as what we call a freelancer, which means uh, many times you will see me uh, having product out from Marvel and DC at the same time. Right. And people are like, how can you do this? Because they're competing companies, they're competitors. But since I work as a freelancer, I'm allowed to work with whoever I wish. Right. So I frequently work for Marvel and DC simultaneously, uh, or I work with other publishers. Um, I just uh, one of my books that just came out was called Storm Kids by um, uh, John Carpenter's company Storm Kings, uh, Storm King. Uh, I'm working on a new graphic novel by PKMM Studios. Um, and I'm still working for Marvel. So um, I work for whoever gives me a fun project, a good opportunity. And I also do a lot of work on my own. I'm working as a freelancer doing work for uh, a pet charity. Uh, there, It's a charity that gives uh, helps people who uh, are struggling with their vet bills. They actually help pay them. Oh, wow. That's awesome. uh, and they're actually having me doing a mini comic book for that for their charity. Uh, so I do all kinds of different things. That's what freelancers do. We basically like, hey, there's a cool project. Let me in on it or, you know, whatever. So, and I get to stretch myself. I get to do, you know, some painted work, some penciling work. So I worked for a video game um, company a short while ago where I penciled and inked, uh, I think it was like a 100-page comic book that was incorporated into their video game. Well, my wife's a vet tech, and you just got a thumbs up for what you just said. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Keith Brunswick wanted to ask. Uh, he said, "What was your? What is your favorite project that you worked on?" There is no set answer to that because so many projects. I've worked on so many really, really fun things. Um, this is going to sound weird, but the the I think the, the by far the most important thing I ever worked on is actually um, is this book, which is uh, hard to see, it, but it's Amazing Spider-Man number 36. Uh, we call it the Black Issue because it has a black cover. Um, that was dealing with 9-11. Uh, we did, uh, I lived in New York City for a long time. The writer and penciler, Marvel Comics, is published there. So that was a very, very... Uh, important visceral story uh, that I think is, if I had none, nothing, nothing else in my career comes close to how 
important that was to me because it was dealing with a real event and real life. It was also the fact that Marvel was always grounded in real world. It wasn't Gotham. It was actually New York. And this is where it happened. Spider-Man, Daredevil, they were all in New York. So, I mean, it touched home to the readers because even if you didn't live in New York, you lived in New York every time you read Spider-Man. Right. I've actually moved out of New York quite a while ago, but I will always be in part a New Yorker. That's kind of like always going to be in me because I lived in New York for so long. Absolutely. Um, so getting back to what we were saying before, how do you think inking influences the, you know, the books you work on and the series that you do? Well, um, in the old days, uh, before my time and even during my time, uh, it used to be very, very common for inkers to be on a series for longer than pencil. Right. Uh, so one of the, uh, one of the earliest ones that I can remember is like Joe Sinnott on the X-Men or sorry, I'm the Fantastic Four. Um, and he basically developed the look of the FF. So it, yeah, he started out with Jack Kirby, but he also worked with John Buscema and Jim, uh, he worked with Buckler, he worked with tons of different people, but he always gave his feel and style to that series. Um, then uh, later on when I was growing up, I remember Terry Austin over John Byrne on the X-Men. And Terry gave it a particular feel. And yes, it was out, obviously John Byrne was the penciler, but Terry gave it this finish, this, this style, this look that was very distinctive to the X-Men beyond any other book that was being published at the time. Um, Scott Williams over Jim Lee developed a really particular look again on the X-Men, but on a lot of other books. Um, when I first got onto Detective Comics, I ended up be working on pretty much, I, I believe I worked on every single Bat title during the course of five years. Uh, it started with uh, Before Nightfall. I actually did, uh, I, my prime book was Detective Comics, which I had an exclusive contract on Detective, but I worked on Shadow of the Bat, Batman, Legends of the Dark Knight, Catwoman, Robin, um, and so I became kind of the bat style guy guy that like if we were doing the bat symbol a certain way, it was my job to make sure it stayed that way no matter what pencil I worked with. And I would frequently even redraw it to make it consistent. I would keep it a certain look. And obviously I worked with my editors on this because like Denny O'Neill hated when uh, they used to do kind of like a, the the Batman TV show of of, a cowl, of just the round yeah. cowl thing. Um, so he's like, no, I don't like that. So even if a penciler gave that to me, Denny was like, break it up a little bit, do something interesting with that cowl. You with Neil Adams. <laughs> I mean, Neil well, Adams always did that. Well, I, a lot of people did and did it well, but because that was not the the look we were going for at the time, right. it was, I was the guy that they kind of went to and said, hey, Scott, do this or fix this or, right. or adjust this. And so a lot of people, and I worked with, uh, again, many different pencilers. I, wor I got to work with Jim Aparo. I got to, uh, I started out working with Tom Lyle. I ended up working with Graham Nolan. And um, it was my job to keep a con consistent look um, on the bat. And um, that, uh, again, my editors would actually show a lot of other artists coming in my stuff to keep it on track. Um, then, then the same thing kind of happened a bit when I went over to Marvel and started working on the Spider-Man books. I was working on various Spider-Man books for about 15 years. And my main penciler during that time was John Romita Jr. But we developed the look for Spider-Man. So even though John Romita Jr. worked with Al Williamson before me and he worked uh, you know, earlier when I was uh, just getting started, he was already work he, he's had multiple runs of Spider-Man, but most people think of Spider-Man as our run together as our team. And I, one of the great things about working with John is every anchor that works with him is allowed to put their style on top of it. Right. Uh, so my version of John Romita Jr. looks different than Klaus Janssen version, looks different than Tom Palmer version. All of us who, you know, are wonderful artists and wonderful teams, but 
I got to do my look on Spider-Man. And so most people associate his main Spider-Man run with the time I worked with him. And then when I started working with other artists like Mark Bagley, I, I did adapt and I changed things, but I had a way of doing the spider symbol or I had a way of doing the web. Um, and again, because I was the consistent one that was there throughout a lot of other editors, a lot of other pencilers, uh, a lot of other inkers were given say, oh, we want it to look like this. Is, it, it, it's usually what it's called an unofficial house style. It's not an official house style, but it is a guideline to, to judge people on or to say, hey, we want to keep it in this direction. I think one of the things comics is missing is the, the consistency of a creative team not switching so often. I mean, I understand why it's happening, but I, I have to say as an old school fan, I do miss that where Claremont 17 years in the X-Men, you know, and, and you just said, you know, 15 years run on Spider-Man books and you created that aesthetic and we, we can associate, you know what I mean? Cause people are creatures of habit. And when you're seeing the, you know what I mean? If you, you kind of, even though the, the character was created years ago, you can kind of make them yours in a way to where now, this is who that character is. We've grown to love, especially if that generation grew up with your Spider-Man, you know? I, I agree 100% because it not, first of all, I think it's great for the fans. If you know what you're getting every month, like the fact that Mark Bagley worked on Ultimate Spider-Man for right. how many issues, but he was the, the, you know, they had the same writer, the same penciler for ages and people, Love that. That was something wonderful. Now, it's hard to do. There are very few people like Ramita Jr. or Bagley that can do a monthly book. Right. Uh, I, I'm actually always astonished that Eric Larson can write pencil and ink a book a month for however many issues he's done Savage Dragon. Um, so it's difficult, and there's a reason why we don't do it, because it is so difficult to do. But I think it's better for the fans. I think it's also better for the creators, because we get to evolve with the character. We get to change, you know, adapt our styles. We get to make an impact. We get to really care about the, those characters we're working on. It's not just a flash in the pan of, oh, it's an assignment that I get this month. It's a, uh, wow, I've been caring about this character and what we do with them for sometimes decades. And that's a big I also think that then when changes for the character happen, they seem more natural, like a human being would evolve in life because you have nurtured this character for so many years, as opposed to a new creative team. I'm going to put my take on Spider-Man. Well, that's a drastic change sometimes that doesn't resonate with fans because people don't change that drastically like that. You know, changes happen through experience and through time. So yeah, when you're a creative team for a long time, you get natural change with the character that is believable and it's, and it's, it's relatable. So yeah, when, I think that's missing. When I was working uh, with uh, Bendis and Bagley on ultimate Spider-Man, uh, Bendis was putting Peter Parker through the ringer. This was yeah, I remember. Before he killed the character. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he, he was lit. I, I think we had, we had killed off Gwen Stacy, the ultimate version of Gwen Stacy. And, and all this horrible stuff kept happening to Peter. And I'm like, man, I, you know, I love what we're doing, but I'm getting depressed. And um, Brian was like, don't worry about it. We got something cool going on here. And uh, so we ended up doing essentially a Freaky Friday story where Wolverine, Ultimate Wolverine and Ultimate and Peter Parker switched brains. Right. And we just did goofy stuff of Wolverine taking over Peter Parker's body and Peter Parker taking over Wolverine's body. And it was, it was fun and it was lighthearted and it was, and it was great because, you know, we all knew we were getting too dark. We needed to lift it up a little bit, make it a little happier. And then we could go back to being serious again and stuff. Um, and we when, don't break. Yeah, when you're working as a team, you can do that very organically, very naturally. And it doesn't disrupt the flow of saying like, oh, we're all of a sudden going to bring in a totally different team to lighten the mood. It's like, no, we did it ourselves in an organic way that really made it work. So Steve Garcia was asking what inkers were your favorite and that you, that what inkers were his faves that he studied and is inspired by? 
Okay, that's an unusual question because uh, most people assume my answer would be famous comic book artists. But in actuality, because I had a, a very broad education in art, I was mostly influenced by what we call the golden age illustrators, who uh, basically in the late 1800s to early 1900s, uh, during the golden, golden age of illustration, the primary print medium for art was actually pen and ink. So we had these phenomenal pen and ink artists uh, like Franklin Booth, like Joseph Clement Cole, Heinrich Clay, um, Frederick Remington. Uh, some, I, I can't even name all the influences that I have, but I still look at those artists for interesting textural techniques, for um, new ways of doing values, for old ways of doing values. So I try to sometimes get out of the comic book box, go back to these classic illustrators who worked exclusively in black and white and pen and ink and see what they were capable of doing. And uh, the work still holds up really, really well today. Um, I've been fortunately compared to some of those artists, which I think is extraordinarily flattering because that's that's my dream to be that good. Well, the, I know you're a motivated man. I know how hard you work. <laughs> By the way, Pamela is getting a lot of love for that shirt in the in the uh, in the comments. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so knowing how hard you work, knowing how much you put out, over twenty one thousand pages inked. Uh, it said that you are the most you have inked the most pages in the industry since recording. And I know that this time you do two to three pages in a day. How do you balance quantity and quality? I mean, most people have to give one, give a little bit on one or the other, but you seem to put out high quality with such a quantity. Well, my, my goal was never to be a fast anchor. I, I didn't want to be the, oh, he's done the most stuff ever guy. That's not, that was never my goal. That was a byproduct somehow, but my goal was always to do quality first. Uh, and, one of the tricky things in the publishing industry is that editors love you to be on time because they can get the product out. Um, especially uh, pu the publishers uh, or the printing companies would frequently punish the publishers if they miss a deadline. So if a book sh shipped a week late, there would be a fee imposed upon the publisher, they'd lose money. OK, so the publisher's incentive was to make sure this came out on time, which is not easy to do when you're dealing with artists. Artists are, you know, not always the most disciplined people in the world. <laughs> like that. So, so from the publisher's point of view and the printer's point of view, they want it to be on time. And the incentive is, OK, get it done. But from the artist's point of view, our name is going on the product. So as soon as I know my name is going in that book, I want it to live up to my standard of quality of, I don't want to be ashamed to say I did that. I don't want to ever say, oh, I did that because it, it doesn't look good because it was rushed. Right. And not only from my own personal point of view, but also because the editors have a very short memory. So editors may know in the back of their head that you saved their butt and met deadline, but six months from now, they'll just remember it's like, man, that, that book looked really bad and they won't remember, or, or another editor at a different company or even at the same company will just see the end result. They're not going to say that, oh, this is what Scott looks like when you're only given two days deadline. Okay they're going to say, this looks bad, or this looks good. That's the bottom line. So if my name goes on it, I always want it to look good. Now, my goal for me, I have very high standards for myself. So my goal is, at least as I evolved as an artist, is I want to make my inking look better than anybody else, if possible. It's not always possible because art is subjective. But also, I want to try to do it in half the amount of time of everybody else. So how can I make it look better in less time? Now, that's usually yet flat out impossible. It's actually it's almost impossible to do that, though I have kind of accomplished it. Um, but the standard is always quality is always the criteria. 
The speed is a secondary thing. If that can come along naturally, great. If it doesn't come along naturally, the quality is by far the most important thing and is always the high standard that we're up to. Well, I firsthand witnessed your confidence in your ability, and I'll explain that in a second. But uh, do you think that confidence is what really helps balance those two? Just because think about it, there's, you can have the talent, but if you don't have the confidence to reach that full talent and just go with it and do what you got to do, can't that slow you up? Yeah, I I believe, in my personal opinion, like people have, I've obviously done so much work that I have to be a fast artist, but it doesn't mean that I'm superhuman and my hand can move faster than somebody else's hand. Or I can, you know, I, I'm not a machine. I'm not a, I'm not ambidextrous. I can't draw with both hands at the same time or anything. Oh, so you do sleep. Well, but people have for years is like, what's got a secret? And they never want to hear the proper secret because the secret is I'm insanely disciplined that I can sit at the drafting table for 12 hours without hardly taking a break. I can draw for when, when people say, oh, I'm drawing for for eight hours today, they're like not really actually drawing for eight hours. They're sitting at a table wondering what they're going to do, getting distracted. They're they're questioning themselves. So, so the confidence aspect allows you to actually put your hand on paper more often. And the more your hand is touching the paper, actually doing the stroke, amazingly, the more you can accomplish in getting the work done. Um, so yeah, it, it's normal for me when I've got deadlines to do, I, I think on average, I generally do about three pages a day of inking over some really detailed ink or, or pencil. Um, actually, the really super detailed guys I've worked with might slow me down to two pages a day. Now, when I say two pages a day, that usually means a 12-hour day. So eight, eight hours to me is like I'm goofing off big time if I'm only working eight hours. That's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm on vacation now because I only work eight hours. Um, so it's amazing what you can accomplish if you work 12 hours at the table. But it takes a lot of drive. It takes a lot of discipline. And it takes a lot of no distraction. So luckily... I've got a very patient, understanding wife who's also an artist, so she understands what it's like to have that drive to be, um, and and self. It, it's not just self discipline; it's it's always trying to get better. It's always pushing yourself to improve and work at it. And and the bottom line for me is, I'm just so grateful that I get paid to do something I love to do. So, and, and yeah, that comment is, no, I am not superhuman. I'm, I'm driven. I'm, I'm kind of superhumanly driven to be um, the best I can be. Um, and also as a teacher, I try to bring that to my students. I try to give everything I can to my students so they can be the best they can be. Well, just real quick to address, Dante wanted to ask a question that I was going to ask you as well. But anybody who has a question that we haven't gotten to, forgive us. But we are doing a 10-minute Q&A after all this is done where we will be devoted to you. So stick around. Save those questions if we did not reach you, and we'll be happy to answer them after the uh, conversation. But Dante asked, how the heck does your back, and I'm going to add how your eye is not going when it's been 12 hours of thinking and drawing Okay, well, the, the back, I actually learned very early on that the back is actually one of the most vulnerable parts of an artist's body. So people are like, oh, do you get hand cramps? It's like, my hands actually are no problem. I have a light touch. Um, holding a stick like a pen or a pencil or a brush is kind of natural for the human body if you don't press down too hard. So one of the secrets is having a light touch. The, you know, if you have a light touch, if you're just flowing with the hand, then it's easy to um, to draw or work for a long period of time. But what I do is when I'm working, I actually decided early on to get uh, my table is at a very, very high tilt, my art, my drafting table. My mother, who's a painter, always paints standing up, which is the best way for your back. Keeps your neck and your back aligned. aligned. Exactly. Now, as an inker, you really can't do that because it, it's almost 
what I do, it's required to have really fine finger control. Right. control. So I have to use a table and rest on the table, but my table's at a very high tilt, so I don't hurt my back. And I also work on a kneeling chair, which means the chair I'm in now is a typical seated chair, but when I'm working at my art table, I'm kneeling on a stool with a knee pad, and that keeps my back aligned and not bent over. Mm -hmm. So my back is kept erect by my chair and my drafting tables at a really high angle. And between those two things, I almost never have back problems. So I recommend that to all artists. Either if you can't stand up at an easel, if you can't use a kneeling chair because it's way better for your back. And never make a practice of drawing at a flat table like we do at conventions. I do it at conventions, but... That's as soon as I get home, I use a real tilted table at a high angle. Can't imagine it would kill you. Just to get back to the confidence for one second, though, I did want to share this story. You know, you and I had discussed this. I want to share it with everybody out there. You all know behind me, I get my jam pieces done. Scott has done pencils on almost every jam piece I have, and they're all incredible. So, again, an inker is an artist, and his pencils are phenomenal. But I had a jam piece that had been inked, and the cape of the character – was a circular cape and but the lines were broken like they didn't finish it I guess because it was close to the top of the page so I see Scott at a show and I said hey Scott can you do me a favor you know whatever can you just fill in that line this is not a straight line it is a very curved line and again the lines are broken there's no there's no line to follow Scott just goes in one quick as if he was scratching you and literally did it go from line to line without being off at all. I mean, and he, he did it with a flick of a wrist so quick that I just went, what the hell did you just, how did you do that? How did you do that? And he just said, look, I'm just confident at this point. After 30 years, if I'm not confident enough to do that, then, you know, I might have to pick another industry. And I was just, I thought it was amazing to see him do that because, again, to meet the other line from your initial, initial point, so clean. I mean, there's no break. It's not uneven at all. It's just insane for me. So yeah, it's funny. I actually, when you made such a big deal out of that when it happened, I was like, "Oh, this is unusual." I, <laughs> I thought it was normal. Yeah. I, I, well, I. It's like a, a professional musician who can play the piano without looking at the keys. I, now, in art, I do have to look, obviously, because you can't meet a line blindfolded, but. Um, I, I have practiced so often with my tools, with my skill set, that I know exactly what, my, what pressure to put down on a pen line, what, how my, my hand works. So if I'm working, I don't know if you can see it or not, but if I'm, on, doing, I'll get you there. Hang on. If I'm doing a line, actually, yeah. Yeah, you're on full screen right now so they can see. Okay, so if I'm doing a line, I want to be able to know where my line is going, what my line is doing, and this is obvious this is actually on an easel so it's a little bit less uh, solid and <laughs> than my normal work, uh, but what happens is you get your hand so it becomes automatic. So I can do these strokes like this almost without thinking of it. I just know that I can do a flick of my wrist and my line will do what I want it to do. You look and, like Morton before he plays pool with Ralph Crandon. Well, I, your wrist. until I started teaching, I didn't realize how refined I had gotten this because I would show this to my students who one of my – the favorite classes of mine is an inking class of teaching people how to use the tools to do traditional inking. And I would do a demonstration and then I'd see my students trying to accomplish the same thing and they just didn't have the hand skills yet. They didn't have the repetition and the muscle memory to create that movement in a natural, easy manner. But again, if you've done 20, actually I think, I haven't kept exact count, but I think it's closer to 23,000 pages I've inked in my career so far. Imagine how many strokes you have to do to accomplish 23,000 pages of art um, and each panel of each page. And, you know, there, there are so many lines you have to put down that 
yeah, I, my hand, my body has to learn how to do it. If I didn't, I, my brain would be not wired right or something. Uh, but it has, it, to me, it has gotten to the point where it is instinctive almost that I, I know what I can accomplish now. At the same time, I'm always trying to teach my brain new tricks. So I'm always trying to come up with new methods and say, oh, what can I do to do it differently than I did it last time? So how about if I um, you know, try to do my cross hatching in a different way? So I can say, oh, I'm just going to start doing some lines here and I want to start playing around with it. So I can actually start doing these unusual things just because I feel like it. And that's one of the other benefits of being a long-term artist is you can just kind of experiment and play with stuff. And this goes back into the confidence aspect of one of the reasons you can be confident is you can be willing to screw up. So. <laughs> If if I'm willing to make a mistake, um, that gives me more confidence. If I'm never willing to make a mistake, and a lot of artists are true perfectionists, that they're like, oh, man, I got to do this exactly right. Uh, but if you're willing to say, hey, maybe I can make it wrong. I can actually do it a little bit awkwardly. I can play around. I can mess up and still see what I do with that that allowed me to have the freedom to go a little bit faster. So as you can see, I'm starting to just very quickly block in some ideas and I don't know exactly what I'm doing. So, um, I mean that in that I haven't done tight pencils. I haven't penciled every single line and mark. I have just blocked in certain placement of what I want to be there. And then I can start adding to it and growing to it as I go along. To me, this is one of the really fun things about my job, especially when I'm doing my own pencils, is I can experiment, I can play, I can uh, goop around a little bit and, um, and see where nature leads you but it does help that I know what I'm capable of. So I know that I can make a, a mark like the line weight change on the cheek. I can do it very quickly with a couple of strokes. If it's not perfect, I can refine it. I can add shadows. I can make it improve as I go along. Do you have any tips as far as line weights and multiple light sources and things of that nature? Uh, those things are actually it, one of the tools of the trade of the artist, uh, or especially the inker, is understanding how light works. So when I say how does light work, uh, some of the things can be very basic, like what direction is the light coming from? Now, I already have determined from this really quick sketch that I just did where my light's coming from. I know that I actually have a light coming from the this side of the face because I started putting a shadow under the mouth. I started putting a shadow under the chin. There's actually even a shadow under the ear. There's a shadow on this side of the eye. So I know that there's a shadow coming this, or there's a shadow side here, there's a light side here. Um, and that's one of the easiest ways we start creating form is by indicating light and shadow. You can see the same thing in the Joker painting behind me. There's a very strong light source coming from the Joker from uh, the right hand side, and there's a shadow side on the other side. Both the Joker and this piece, I've also started determining where there's a secondary light source. And what do we mean by secondary light source is that this side of the face is also white. It's not totally black. Uh, if you look at the Joker, one side of its face is purple, one side is close to white, and that indicates that the purple side is in shadow, but there's also a bit of red light coming in from the background hitting his face. So I've got multiple light sources going on in color, 
in black and white, I have to indicate or frequently have to indicate multiple light sources so that the colorist can go in and apply his color in the right manner. That means that uh, if I'm doing this shadow shape on the cheek, that's indicating to the colorist that you can't make this flat flesh color and this flat flesh color. I want this to usually be a different color of light coming in here. So I've actually had multiple discussions with colorists where I do a shadow line in between two planes of the face and the colorist will color it flat. And I would call up the colorist and say, <clears throat> shadow there. That means that there are two light sources. And this, this one particular colorist, I won't give a name, he said, oh, well, no matter what you give me, I'm going to color it with one flat color. I said, no, you can't do that. I'm indicating there are two light sources. Right. And so I explained to him, and I actually did a demonstration for him um, in Photoshop saying, this means one light source, this means another light source, they're usually of unequal value, meaning one is brighter than the other. And I said, we'll make it really easy. Every time I do a line like that, just make one side a cool color and one side a warm color. Right. And do something like yellow and blue or orange and purple or any color combinations you want but just make one side warm, one side blue. And it doesn't matter which side. <laughs> and he started following my directions and it was great. Every time he followed my directions and followed the hints I gave him in the inking, he nailed it and he just, the, the whole work was better. Now there's some uh, colors I work with that I know they're gonna get it right off the outset. Like uh, I've, I've had the really good fortune to work with uh, artists like uh, Laura Martin. Laura's one of the best in the business. And every time I give her any indication of a light source or multiple light source, I know she will immediately pick up on it, know what to do with it, and make it even better. And so that's part of the communication. That's part of the collaboration. And um, part of my understanding as an artist that I have to understand what the colorist will do after I'm done with my work. Even if I'm the colorist, I want to know where to go. So I have to, under, the more I understand color, the more I understand light, the better the end product will be. What are your thoughts on cross hatching as far as, you know, the different shades of shadow that are on a, on a, on the anatomy? Well, one of, one of the big things that, the, the way we represent form is primarily through what we call value, which is how light or dark something is. So for instance, I very quickly started indicating that there's darkness in this area. It gets a little bit lighter here and darker here. What? Your speaker is crackling, slow down. So uh, I just got a note that my speaker is crackling a bit. So sorry about that. Um, one of the things I can do is I can darken a tone by putting more lines on it. So if I want this area to be darker, I can start doing the line in different directions to make that value darker and make it more convincing as a shadow. So I can do this with parallel lines all going together in one direction, which we call hatching. I can do it with two directions or as many directions as I want. I can do five or six directions. I can do 10 directions. I can literally do as many directions as I care to to make it the dark value that I would like it to be. So, and one of the primary techniques we do for cross hatching is we also want to make darkness fade into light. So we frequently call this feathering, where I will take a dark area and want to make it go lighter. So I will open up the lines and fade this into a solid block. That's so, a lot of talent to be able to ch change the pressure of your hands in that one fell swoop. And that's, yes, it's, it's entirely about the pressure you're putting down how hard you're pushing down, how you're picking up or pushing down on the pen or the brush. And that's why my favorite tools are using a brush or a quill pen that are very, very pressure sensitive. So that's why having a light touch is very helpful. So we have to know when 
and how much to just lift up with a little touch of your fingers to lift that up to make it go from dark to light like that. By the way, we have, um, oh, where'd he go? Sorry, that was the wrong one. Dennis, uh, Dennis Chrysostomo. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I'm sorry. He's an artist. Uh, the same techniques in inking other artists when you are working on your own drawing, or does it differ sometimes? So do you use the same techniques in inking other artists um, or when you're all working on your own? Um, yeah, I pretty much use the same tools, but it depends on which artist I'm working with. I might be predominantly using a brush with somebody who's a very fluid style, very slick style. I'll use a lot more brush with my ink when I'm doing um, a more hard edged uh, linear style of penciler, I will be predominantly a pen inker. So I'll do more uh, quill pens and nibs that give a harsher, sharper line to them. Uh, so I adapt my tool depending on which artist I'm working with. And I do the same thing with my own work. So if I'm working, um, in a very, like if I want to do a lot of hair, I will usually use a brush because a brush has a very fluid long line and I can do a very long stroke that's very smooth. If I'm doing something delicate, like if I were doing teeth or if I were doing a hand, I might do a lot more pen work uh, and I'll adapt my tool depending on what style I'm looking for, what my project is, even what the character is. Um, like if I'm working on Batman, I want to use a lot of shadows. I'm going to use a lot of solid blacks. If I'm working on, um, I had a recent Booster Gold commission. I always think of Booster Gold as a very much a daytime uh, character that he's bright. He's not using shadows the same way. Um, I have a, I tend to like, uh, one of my big influences, I love film noir. I, I watch movies all the time. I love black and white movies. I love the harsh lighting, the, the very strong lighting that we do in film noir all the time. So uh, if I'm doing Batman, I'm going to do my film noir stuff. If I'm doing Spider-Man, I probably won't be doing my film noir stuff. Um, so this is actually a traditional brush that you can see it actually comes to a very fine point. It's actually flexible. It's literally made of uh, hair, of fiber. And um, this is one of my favorite tools. I can also use a quill pen like this. And this actually has a metal tip that you dip into a bottle of ink. Both of these I would dip into a, a bottle of ink. And then I would ink uh, using a quill pen for really fine line quality. There's no ink on here, so it won't work. Um, but this would actually give me my really fine lines. The brush would fill in a lot of my contour lines, my long lines, my bold lines, and my fine black areas, or I can mix and match them. Uh, I very, very frequently mix and match my tools and my techniques. So I, will, I might start with a brush and I'll go to a pen, or I might start with a pen and go to a brush and I'll mix and match depending on what I'm trying to achieve. But uh, essentially you use every tool at your disposal. So with that said, uh, any projects you're working on now that you can share with us that aren't top secret? <laughs> um, well, I, I can share one of the, the projects I'm working on, but I can't show you because it is top secret until we, we get the book out there, but one of uh, a really, really fun project I'm so excited on um, that I'm working on right now is called Werewolf by Night. We're doing a totally new interpretation of the Marvel Werewolf by Night characters. Uh, so this is not um, just an updating of the classic Werewolf by Night. This is a new take on the characters, um, actually brand new characters in reality. Um, but it's a really phenomenal project. I'm working with uh, a phenomenal penciler I've worked with before, Scott Eaton. Uh, so we've got two Scots on the book. Uh, I'm working with two different writers. Um, uh, one of them, Taboo, is a famous musician. Um, so he's bringing, uh, they're, they're both bringing this amazing um, 
style and feel to it because of the musical aspect. We're actually doing musical references in the storyline. Um, it's actually incorporating it into the character. We're doing tattoo elements. We're doing all these different cool uh, takes on it. And it, we're starting it out as a four issue mini series, which I believe is launching in October of this year. Uh, we've been working on it for a while already, but it will be coming out then. Makes sense for a werewolf story to be coming out in October. Um, but it's it's a really fun project, and I really, really hope it launches us into something like an ongoing series because we can take this in so many different directions. And it is such a, the, the the whole team is fantastic. It's 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 one of my classic uh, comic experiences where everybody's worked together from editorial all the way down to colors and letterer that we're working as a unit. We're working. Uh, we're pushing each other, we're stretching each other, we're having fun with it, and it's just a really, really fun project, and I cannot wait for this to hit the stands. Well, I think, actually, there's a big uh, gap right now in, you know, Marvel horror. You know, we had Dracula in the 70s, and, and then we had Blade come out, and we had, you know, Man-Thing. We had the horror aspect in Marvel that we haven't seen in a long time, so this could launch that again. I know there's a lot of people that love horror, and they miss the Marvel horror stories that were out. So this could, you know, this could be a big thing. I, I'm hoping so. I it, It's funny because Scott Eaton and I had actually worked on uh, the Conan book Serpent War, which is a big crossover between all the Robert E. Howard heroes and they also were tying it into the Marvel Universe. So we got to do Moon Knight and Conan and Solomon Kane. And in that series, we worked on the first issue of the, the mini- mm -hmm. And we got to do a classic image of Moon Knight fighting Werewolf by Night, uh, kind of flashback to the Marvel storyline. And that got such good reaction. I was like, wow, you guys do, guys do a really good werewolf. <laughs> so, so then we got the book Werewolf by Night. It was like, yay, we get to do werewolves. And, and um, as an inker, like I love uh, – animals and because I get to play with textures when we're doing fur, when we're doing monsters, you get to play with all these textural visual aspects. And uh, so it's a, it's just a really fun project. I, I, like I said, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Uh, anytime I get to work with Scott Eaton, it's a joy uh, having the two Scots teaming up together. It's just a real pleasure. Again, we push each other all the time and, and we, you know, the goal is for everybody to make the end product as, as superior as we possibly can. So Dante had asked, do you ever plan on going creator owned and creating your own universe? Or are you just really happy playing in other people's sandboxes with their toys, so to speak? Uh, the answer is both. I actually, I love working on characters that I grew up with. Um, I, you know, my favorite characters when I was growing up were coincidentally Spider-Man and Batman, who I spent most of my career drawing. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, being an artist, being a creative person, I love working on new ideas. So uh, because we've had this weird COVID situation, um, I, I've actually brought up from some things I've worked on in the past that I'm starting to flesh out and coming up with creator on projects. I worked with some independent companies, like I'm working with Guy Dorian Jr. on a book called Core. We just worked on Hyperbreed, Hyperkids together, which are essentially creator on characters. Not he created them, not me, but I'm working on creator on books and projects and realizing how fun it is and thinking it's like, oh, if we can do this through this publisher or or whatever, I can do it too. So I'm starting to come up with these great ideas that have been burning in the back of my head for a long time and saying, well, maybe now is the time to start fleshing this out and really starting to progress it and get it out there to the public. And I've had, again, I've got some of the best fans in the universe that people said, hey, if, you, if you're going to do a Kickstarter, let me know. I'll help promote it or I'll help you work on it. Um, and I know a lot of other creators who have done self-published work, so they've led the way. And I'm like, hey, wait, this is this is the future, kind of. We can keep doing this. So I'll probably never want to stop entirely working for Marvel and DC, but 
the we have the potential to go our own way and do our own things now. And as a creative person, that always enjoy and even to get to pick your own teammates. You know, a lot of times in comics, I get recommended on a project by a penciler, by a writer, by an editor. But if it's a creator own project, you can say, hey, I love working with you. Let's work together. Um, you know, so I can work with a colorist or, or a writer uh, that I want to work with. If it's even if it's me or my wife or uh, a friend that I've wanted to work with for a long time or haven't worked with it for a long time and really loved when I did work with them. So there are all these possibilities for the future um, that are in the works right now. So I've got a couple of creator run projects I'm working on. Uh, one is actually uh, an historical World War II story, uh, which is phenomenal. So we're getting to do all this research on actual World War II things and and uh, do airplanes and, and uniforms and equipment. Um, some of them are dealing with animals because I love animals. So uh, I'm very much of a cat person. I love all animals. And so we, we've got a cat-centric story that I'm working on. You get more uh, thumbs up for my wife. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's cool when you can, when your passions, when your love of things in you know, your normal life can get thrown into your creative life, and the best creative stuff happens when it all comes together. Well, this is the age of uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo and indie comics and everything are making a big surge right now. Obviously, the climate helped that. Uh, but, I mean, this is the time for you to jump. Yeah, if, if you have yeah. those ideas, get them together and put them out there. And you obviously you know you have the support for it. Um, well, also, I, yeah, it, it also ties into my teaching. A lot of people told me I should do more, you know, live stream and, and demonstrations to shut because – this ties in totally to what I do as a teacher. I share knowledge and I share information. So reaching a broader audience is always great. So because of the shutdown, I had to start switching to a lot of my classes are being done digitally. So I do it on a Zoom class with a student instead of doing it one-on-one. -on -one. I prefer one-on-one, -on -one, but I, you can get across a lot of in, information because we have technology now. We can do this stuff. So it's a great experience to reach more people. Well, don't you have free classes on your wife, Pamela Patak's uh, Instagram going on? Yes. On both my Instagram, on hashtag Inker Scott, on uh, her Instagram, on uh, the Arts and Fashion Institute School. So it's called artsandfashioninstitute.com or AFI Art School Free Classes. And you um, have the hashtag too, which is an easy way to get there, right? Right. AFI free art classes. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, I just got coaches. AFI free art classes with the hashtag. Right. That's hashtag. the easiest way to get there is to get that hashtag. And so you can see a lot of clips of we started it just because my wife would film me while I was at conventions. And uh, so we would do little clips of, of me in the process of drawing. And it's actually really weird whenever I look at those because I'm like, oh, I guess I do draw pretty fast <laughs> because yeah. I see, see how I'm doing. When you're doing it, you don't, you're in the moment. You're not paying attention. But when right. you from a removed thing, it's always kind of wonky and weird. It's like, wait, that's really me drawing that? That's some other, that, that's an alternate version of me actually doing those drawings. It's kind of weird. What we have learned today, though, is, with every great man, there's an equally or better great woman next to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was so fortunate because I met my super talented wife when we were both in art school. We went to Pratt Institute in New York City, uh, still one of the top art schools in the entire country. Um, and Thanks, Dante. So, so getting to marry, getting to meet, getting to marry another talented artist um, makes you encourage each other, makes you grow each other, makes you push each other. Uh, but we also can understand each other because she's as driven as I am. She is as much of a perfectionist as I, if not more so than I am. Uh, so we're both artists together working in a, in a loving relationship and it makes you uh, put up with each other to a degree. So uh, I, I, my wife learned a long time ago that, you know, in a lot of respects, deadlines come first. So if I've got a deadline, meet that deadline to the best of your ability, which means maybe don't get sleep that night. And that means right. I can't, you know, and she understood that 
about what I do that she 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 knows it doesn't mean I don't love her <laughs> if, right. I, if I'm ignoring her in a particular moment. Um, but and the same thing if she's got a wedding dress she's working on, I know I will not see her for a couple of weeks because uh, or or it could be a cosplay costume for for a, a client or for herself, or it could be working on masks for a hospital that needs to get there at a certain time. Um, so there are times when I have to understand, okay, her skill and her art come first, I come second, but we know love each other no matter what. Well, I've had the great pleasure of meeting your wife, Pamela. She's very lovely. She's very kind. She's great to talk to. The two of you, you married well, and the two of you are excellent to talk to. You're very humble but very talented and we appreciate that. So yeah. having said that, um, I wanna ask you, if you could go back 30 years to your yourself when you were starting out in the industry, what advice would you give yourself? Um, that's a really tough question because I love what I did. So I, you know, I have that kind of dream job of 10 year old Scott that I get to draw comic books every day of my life pretty much. Uh, which is an amazing gift. That's I work really, really hard at it to be good at it and to earn that gift. But it is still a gift. It's it's a wonderful thing to get to do what you love to do. Um, so going backward in time, saying how would I do it different if I already had such a wonderful experience is really tough. But I remember um, not quite 30 years ago, but. I started out as a penciler and inking my own work, and I gravitated more toward inking. Um, knowing what I do now with how comics evolve, I wish I had done even more penciling. But beyond that, actually, uh, when I was working on the Batman books during Nightfall, um, I remember I had a really, really good relationship with my editors. They, they knew how well I could draw. And I, I said that in my free time, which I don't have a lot of, I actually love to paint. Um, and one of my editors said, it's like, oh, you know, bring in some paintings. We'd love to see what your paintings would be like. Um, and I, I never really did. I never really had time to take like a week off and do a gorgeous painting to bring into DC at the time. And I kind of regret that because it would have been nice to have also shown off my painting skill uh, starting 30 years ago and maybe getting to do not just, you know, drawing Batman, but also maybe painting Batman or, or painting any number of other uh, subjects. But the cool thing is that you can always do it in the future. So now I'm doing more painting. I started doing it a lot more as a teacher because my students were like, Hey, I I want to learn painting. I'm like, cool. I know how to paint, and I would show them, and that would get me inspired to do more paintings on my own. So, um, so yeah, painting is one of my fun hobbies that I can also use as my profession, uh, and it's something I again I start painting at a very early point in my life. I'm still doing it now, and I love doing that. Uh, and there's always the opportunity to do more. Oh, I've got a guest star. Speaking of cats, I've got uh, somebody sneaking into my. Uh, yes. I, I my wife is one. here playing guard because my cat keeps coming into. My wife is here holding him now. <laughs> yeah, this, this one is actually posed for me. Um, I used her as a model for uh, a couple of black cat illustrations where I, I because this is a tuxedo cat and black cat in the comic books is basically based on a tuxedo style cat. So I've used her as a model for, uh, I think, a painting I did of Black Cat. Actually, two paintings I did of the character. Uh, so, And I also, I'm even doing some, uh, speaking of paintings, I'm doing some commissions right now that are actually painted commissions, which is really fun. Well, your cat's doing like every other cat, has to find whatever iPad, newspaper, whatever you're working on to lay on. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Luckily, because I have my drafting table at a height tilt, she can't walk on my artwork. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a must. So she can't walk in this because it's upright. That's She'll the other thing to learn. So we're, we're going to go into a Q&A session for people. We were going to do 10 minutes, but if you're up to it, we could do a little longer. It's up to you. Okay, we'll see how um, it goes. I know we, we missed a few questions. I do apologize. Um, but if you have questions, this is the time now to throw them out there. Um, 
And if you don't, then we won't have a 10 minute Q&A. We'll cut it short. <laughs> you can use it any other way you want. And I also want you to, to please plug anything you want. I mean, I know we've spoken about some things. Feel free to plug everything and anything again. Um, if you want to continue with some art um, instruction, please go ahead. You know, let's do some free time here and go from there. Yeah, let's let's get into the questions. I know Pete Vasquez. I don't know if he's still with us. He asked a question earlier. I can look it up and let's see what he said. Pete, oh Pete, where art thou, Pete? He asked something about the 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 actual what you use your your utensil you know what kind of pens and ink and oh here we go uh what supplies scott uses is it the hunt 102 or has he uh, have you gone digital i know someone else uh, steve garcia asked about digital what kind of paper do you use uh, uh, i i have lit i have not gone digital pretty much at all i will use digital um normally in our production of comic books i have to uh I work traditionally, uh, though nowadays we do frequently what's called working for blue line scans. Uh, so uh, my cat is knocking me. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, so uh, I will sometimes work from digital scans, print them out as blue lines, ink them traditionally, scan them back into the computer, and then I might do some cleanups or touch-ups digitally. I, I've done certain corrections digitally, like, uh, one time a few years ago, we did, uh, I was working with Tom Gromit on a book and we did, I think we we're up to like page 19 of a story. And then the editor said, oh, I'm really sorry. The style guide we gave you for one of the characters that's on like 15 pages, we got her hair wrong. Could you redo her hair? Like, oh, oh. And, and hair, and so with traditional media, redoing 15 pages of hair is a pain in the butt. So what I did was I went in and used my drawing tablet and I corrected it digitally. So if you look at, if you bought the original pages for the, that story, the character has totally different hair than what was printed. But I prefer to do traditional whenever humanly possible. Um, as far as my tools, I was holding up a couple of them. My, my favorite traditional tool, what I started with with the quill is the Hunt 102, uh, though now I will use um, variations of that, including, um, actually, I'm horrible at remembering the numbers and names, but uh, I started out using a 102, then I started using a 104 sometimes and a 107. Now, now I actually use a combination of about six different pen points, including one of my favorite uh, pen points is actually called the Esterbrook, um, which is, this is a pen manufacturer that went out of business, I think something like 70 years ago, but their quality of work is so good that they had a lifetime guarantee on their pen points. And their pen points, you can actually get a case of like, uh, I think a gross, which is 12 dozen pen points would come in a box. And I get a lot of those, and I still use those pen points. Uh, I was using them even when I was a kid because my mom had some. Um, they can cost a bit, uh, but you can usually get them uh, online. You can search them out, and I find them to be invaluable. I love those pen points. They, they maintain uh, quality longer than almost any other pen point. For the brushes, my traditional brush is – I use a Winsor Newton Series 7, um, which is a made of Kalinsky sable. It's a very expensive brush. It's a watercolor brush. But the reason I love it is because it has an amazing point to it. It, it can spread out very wide or get to a really, really fine line point uh, when I'm doing my brush work. And it allows me really good control. The, the Series 7 usually has a relatively short bristle, which allows me to have really super fine control over my line and my point. Mark Torres has two questions for you. The first is, when inking and you know the finished piece or book will be in black and white, do you approach it differently? As opposed to knowing a colorist is going to come on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I started out, I was actually penciling and inking for <laughs> black and white comic book publishing. So they actually did not print color comics. They printed black and white comics. 
So when you print it in black and white, you expect a lot more line work is going to show up. You have to create, you have to do more with the values. So I love, I, I will even do gray washes sometimes if it's going to be printed in black and white. Um, actually, hold on a second. I'm going to pull out the piece. Hopefully you can see this. This is actually not for a comic book. This is actually a book illustration. And it's framed in glass, so it might be a little bit shiny. Right, it's good. There's no glare there. But um, you can see this is actually uh, for a book illustration that's printed in black and white. So it's not meant to be colored. Because it's not meant to be colored, I did a lot more with the values, with the detail of it. Now, I've done this much detail in comic books on occasion, but most of the time there's no point in doing all this fine. Oh, that's a cat again. Um, anyway, there's, there's no point in doing all this detail if it's going to be printed in color because a lot of times the color will actually hide the line work. Um, now, now that we have digital, um, more of the, the print quality is better, the reproduction quality, and the digital screening actually can show up more line work. So I probably more do more fine line and detail work now than I did 30 years ago, but um, it, it really depends on the situation and the pencil. But overall, value is even more important when we're doing it for black and white publication when we're doing it for color, I have to do as many clues and cues as I can so the colorist can do their job. And I have to understand what the colors will, how they will affect my work, how they will sometimes hide my work. If I'm working with somebody I'm not used to or who's not, you know, they don't read my work properly, I might do bolder lines or I might do flatter outlines or I might do more dimensional outlines to really showcase where the highlight's going to be. So I adapt myself to the printing circumstances, to the color circumstances, to the team circumstances. Mark also asked, what were your thoughts and opinions on the time when Marvel went straight from pencils to colors? Um, in, in my opinion, I, never, I, I really actually hated that phase, not just because I'm an inker, but because I'm a painter um, that in order for you to see good quality work, we need to have contrast. If you look at the Joker painting behind me, I'll actually bring it forward a bit. So this, actually, this painting, I'm still using black. Now, obviously, he has a black shirt, but he also has a very dark shadow in the lapel. He has dark in his hair. Even there, there's darkness in the nostrils and the mouth. If you took all the black out of this Joker painting, it would look like a washed out image. It would look dull and not as as strong and it won't have as much impact. Um, and that's what happened for a, that period of time where they were trying to do scans directly from pencils. That Now, if you had a really good painter colorist, they would know to put in the right values into it. But most of the time, everything looked washed out. It looked like if you've ever had your printer run out of black ink and try to print a photograph without any black in it, it doesn't look right. It looks dull and, and wrong. That's what happens when we're doing, um, inking is the black plate of the printing process. Inking is what gives us that, that weight and that power and that impact. And so to me, I think, using black, whether you're a painter or an inker, is a really important part of the process. And another thing that actually one of my painter friends first brought to my attention is he actually hated that scanning from pencil going directly to paint because he said, have you ever noticed that in a comic book especially, the word balloons are black ink on white paper? And because the words are printed in black, it actually ties into having black in the art itself. So the black ink work in, and the line work in the art ties into the fact that in the print medium of comics, we use words. And so the words look better next to the ink line than they do against washed out non-ink lines. Does anybody else have any other questions in the Q&A? 
<clears throat> anybody going once, going twice? Anybody, anybody? Okay. All right. Well, Scott, I, I wanted to say this before we wrap it up today. Um, in all seriousness, on a human level, on a personal level, you obviously have accomplished a lot in your career. And you could easily have, well, you really could easily have a, uh, an ego. <clears throat> I approached you uh, two years ago for my first show as a fledgling. No, no proof of what was going to happen. And you were kind enough to be a guest on my show. And, and you really elevated, obviously, the credibility of the show. You've been a good friend to me since then. You've blessed my jams with some amazing work. Every time I speak with you, you're a very humble, very down-to-earth, kind person. I know it's embarrassing you a little bit right now. I can see it in your face. But with all sincerity, you really are one of the finest people I've met in the industry. And I really appreciate you coming out and being my first guest on the show. It's been a success. And that's obviously because of my guest, not because well, of me. I do have to say, to, I, I, I really want to give your show props because you put on a show that's like – the classic comic book show that you care about the creators, you care about the fans, uh, you make it about comics. You don't make it about, uh, you know, everybody out in the universe. Um, and for uh, those of us who love comics who work in comics, that's what we we're there for. And we want to connect with the fans. I love conventions where I can actually talk to people. Uh, and your show is one of those where it's not so humongous that you get lost in the crowd. Um, you know, gigantic shows are great. I do New York Comic Con every year, but I love the smaller shows where I can actually spend time with people and communicate one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. Um, I've, I've had so many fantastic experiences with fans, and even a lot of fans have become friends. You know, I've gotten to be friends with people I've met at shows. Um, because they're just so nice. Uh, Dante is actually one of those. Um, Don, Dante is, you know, he's so wonderful that, you know, he he takes care of me when I'm at a show. I want to take care of him back. I just want to be, you know, I I want to be friends with these people because they love the same things I love. I'm so, I said before, I'm still a fan at heart. So we're still all the, I, I always want to remember until I die, I want to remember the time when I was on the other side of the table coming up to the artist that I love. And I've been so fortunate because I've gotten to work with so many of those people that I used to be on the other side of the table of. And I've gotten to be friends with them. I've gotten to be coworkers, and I've had other people who met me at a con or who uh, I helped encourage them that they became professionals as well. Uh, so it's a it's a wonderful circle that helps everybody. Well, the fact that you're confident but humble is is a very strong quality. It says a lot about you. Uh, as far as Dante, he's a big supporter of me too. He's just an all around good guy. So I say thank you to him. There's a lot of people I can thank right now. Um, that are supportive, and I'll do it another time. But uh, I really appreciate you coming out. You are always welcome back. I really look forward to where we can get conventions again so we, we can see you and, and, and have that interaction because it is always, no matter what, it's a pleasant interaction to come see you at your table. And I still, you have that inked jam piece that I've got to get. <laughs> you have my inked jam piece that Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> It's all done. It just has to be mailed out to you. Yeah, but we're going to yeah, take major precautions. Uh, yeah, just, just as one last note, that because of the, the lack of conventions this year, normally I do not do at-home commissions because I'm working full-time for Marvel and DC and I'm doing conventions. So in the past, my sketch list was pretty much confined to only when you saw me at a convention, you could get a sketch from me. But because the conventions are not running this year, I actually am doing at-home commissions. So if anybody's interested, they can contact me on Instagram, hashtag Inker Scott, or here on Facebook, Scott Hand on Facebook. You can message me, uh, and you can actually get commissions from me. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually only about a week or so behind right now on my sketch list because uh, I've been working on Werewolf by Night this week. 
uh, that distracted me a bit. Uh, but I'm I'm very happy to do commissions. Or you can also contact me through my art dealer, theartistchoice.com. They he arranges uh, commissions for me and sells all my original artwork that I have for sale. Spencer Beck. Spencer, Spencer Beck, Beck is. is yeah. I, I worked with Spencer before I became well known. So way before I got onto Batman or Spider Man, I was working with Spencer. And one of the things I've always loved about Spencer is Spencer got into the business because of the old guys who weren't getting enough attention. So he still cares about the classic artists, the or the artists that I grew up with. Um, and he just he he's he's been a really good buddy and a good friend. And uh, he so he's a great one to sign up with commissions for me or uh, like John Romita Jr., Mark Bagley, tons of other artists he works with as well. Yeah, I've uh, worked with Spencer with my shows and he definitely cares about his his artists. He makes sure you're well taken care of, makes sure that, you know, the promoters are doing right by you. So as a matter of fact, he was at my last show and he was very happy with how well I treat the artists. So that's a good thing. <laughs> yes, you treat us well. You treat us, uh, there's no complaints whatsoever. So thank you so much. Well, again, listen, thank you to you. Thank you to Pamela, you know, for all her help and, and making sure, you know, she's keeping you in line. And um, her work is wonderful and what she's doing is wonderful. So please go to her Etsy store. Please check out their school. Uh, classes are starting up soon. You are not going to learn from a better teacher. I mean, there's a, the, the compassion that's involved while building your confidence, but at the same time really teaching you what you need to know. I highly recommend it. Um, again, Scott, thank you so much for coming out, and I hope to have you back. And, again, thank you. Thank you so much. Had a great time. And, yeah, keep on, keep on doing this. You're doing a great job. Thanks. I hope to. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Have a good night, everybody. So that was episode one. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, we had a pretty good turnout. I am grateful for everybody that came out. I'm grateful for the participation. You guys are all awesome. I really appreciate the support. I know Scott does because Scott is a really good guy. I'm just going to let you know that Tuesday I have Al Garza coming on. Uh, the following Friday I have Will Conrad coming on. Uh, the following Friday after that, he just wrote here, Geraldo Borges. I hope I pronounced your name right, buddy. Uh, another fantastic artist. Uh, he will be on. Chris Campana will be on. Rob, uh, Shelby Robertson, Jason Metcalf. And I'm telling you, we're going to have some great people. I mean, I'm talking Rags Morales. I'm talking Keith Williams. I'm talking Chris Batista. I'm talking Joseph Rubenstein. Um, uh, I mean, uh, Alex Sinclair. We have a lot of people, Ryan Kincaid, Mike DeBalfo, Sora Sung, and then we have some great uh, young unpublished or just newly published talent coming, uh, like Lula Lucas, and we're going to have Christopher Tomulovich on, and we're going to have a lot of people on here. Got a friend here, Dan Lee, who's got a book that's about to come out. He'll be on here eventually. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody coming out. Please continue to follow, support, and share. This is for the artists. I make nothing from this. I don't want to make anything from this. I don't need to. All right. Hey, Jacob Bear, how are you? So, uh, unfortunately, we're just wrapping up, Jacob. I'm sorry. But you can see it. It'll be there for you to watch. Uh, so Again, thank you for the support. Come back Tuesday, 10 p.m. for Al Garza. Of course, I'll be flooding everything and spamming so you can all see it, okay? You guys are awesome. I've met some really great people. You're all in this thread. God bless you guys. And anybody that wants promotion, before every show, I will announce three to five people. I will give you a shout out. I will just shout you out. All your all your links, all your projects. You have a Kickstarter. You're an indie. You're even an unpublished artist who just wants attention to your page to get commissions. You let me send me a, a, a direct message, and you will be uh, getting a shout out before a show. Okay, you guys be good. Take care. Oh, um, I leave you with this. Have fun storming the castle.